you will take your Bibles, our text today, although we'll only be in it briefly, is Colossians chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27. So Colossians 1, 26 and 27. And so some months ago, in March actually, I, Cal came to me with a question from his reading. And the question was, the relationship between the term mystery in our English Bibles and in the Greek and the term sacrament, which is found translating the word mystery in in the Latin Bible and then is used, of course, in English in various ways in the the church, in in more liturgical churches, of course, they call what we're going to celebrate today a sacrament. Now, we don't call it a sacrament. We call it an ordinance. We call it a communion service, the Lord's table. Now, it's interesting in doing this research. So, I had this question, and I thought, oh, I know somebody, I'm sure he'll have the answer. So, I wrote to my friend, uh, Mark Ward, and he didn't have the answer for me. I thought for sure he would. And so then uh, we just sort of had to shelve it. He gave me a few things that he had found, but it wasn't much. And then here uh, last week, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, I quoted uh, a part of a sermon from Origen in our church uh, service, in our afternoon service, and I and it was so I was so taken by it. I thought I should read some more of these in this book I found online. They're his sermons from the book of uh, uh, Joshua. So I started with the first one, got into the second page, hit a footnote where he had mentioned something, and the uh, editor had explained in a footnote something that gave me the clue to the relationship between these two words. And then the answer was found in a book I've had all along in my library. So that was really quite amazing. However, it's a very interesting term. So I've given the message the title, What is the Mystery in Sacramentum? And so we're going to just sort of work through. I do have, uh, I got a little bit of introduction here. Now the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, doesn't always use sacrament to translate mystery. In the Greek New Testament, there are 28 places where the word, the Greek word mystery, occurs. Only seven of them are translated with sacrament in Latin. For the rest, the Latin simply transliterates the Greek, and they have a a Latin word mysterium, which is just a transliteration of the Greek. Same with our English word mystery. It's just a transliteration of the Greek. The Greek word is mousterion. All right, so... It's, it's one word, really, in three languages. So, uh, I put in my notes. Okay, so there's, so the Latin, you go and you're reading through, and I just went and checked. I brought the Latin up on my computer. I can't read Latin, but I can read, I can identify the word sacrament. So I went through all these verses, and so many of them, they're, they're getting this Latin mysterium, mysterium, mysterium. Oh, there's a sacramentum. And there's another one. There are seven of the 28 references that are translated in the Latin Bible with the word sacrament. I put in my notes, it is a bit of a mystery to me why the Latin isn't consistent. It's sometimes mystery, sometimes sacrament. And there doesn't seem to be any direct reason why that is so. And you'll see that actually in our text for today. So I'm going to show that to you now, and I've got in brackets the Latin. So first, uh, Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27. He starts off, that is, the mystery, in Latin, mysterium, verse 26, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, in the Latin, sacrament, sacramenti, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So in this passage, and this, the reason I cho- there's two reasons I chose this passage. One is uh, that we have the term, in Latin we have both terms in the same passage. They're referring to the same thing. 
Right? Not, it's not like, okay, one, there's a deeper meaning in verse 27 than there is in verse 27. Verse 26. For some reason, the Latin translator, Jerome, or whoever it was, just, he, he varied the word. Why? Don't know. All right, we don't know. And there, I, I can't see any real difference between these two references in these two verses. So I, again, I said, here you have the same concept and both Latin terms, a mystery. Okay, so if you look up sacramentum on Google, you will find mystery as the translation. All right, however, I found a few other things that are worth spending some time on to increase our understanding. Um, now, and as I mentioned, the liturgical, liturgical churches use the word sacrament for the communion service. I'll just take a brief moment to explain why we don't use that word in a Baptist church. Uh, the, the, there is a root, the sacro, sacrament root, I'll get to it in, again in a minute, but sacra means holy, it refers to things that are holy. The idea that in the liturgical churches, and by that I mean the Anglican, Catholic, sort of the Lutherans, sort of the Presbyterians, they're getting a little further away from it. There's the idea that when you take communion, you get a spiritual benefit. You get a holy, something happens in you. All right, now... I think we, as we experience communion, we do worship the Lord. We have a spiritual experience, but it has nothing to do with the taking of the bread and the juice. That is only a symbol. It's a symbol of something. All right. So we don't believe that we get any extra grace from taking communion. All right. So, so we see it as a memorial. And so we would strongly, we would not use the word sacrament to describe it. However, in just studying the history of this word, in Greek and in Latin, and then in English, we do find something, I think, very interesting. And it points to the last phrase of Colossians 1.27, which is the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. But through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection for us, we put our faith in him, we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a very powerful concept. It comes about as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the topic is appropriate, I think, for our communion service. All right, so we're going to go on this word study. So first of all, the Greek background of mystery. So in, in the Greek culture, there was these things called the mystery religions. Mystery religions. So you'll see some references to them. Uh, there's various different ones. They worship different gods. Uh, the religions are called mystery religions because they kept their doctrines and their secrets as a secret. In order to get into one of these religions, you had to go through an initiation ritual. And in the, after the initiation ritual, you are given uh, some of the teachings, the secret teachings, but the initiation ritual was a time when you swore you would not tell anything you learned inside the religion. And so, uh, now of course, not everybody kept those oaths. But most people did. So consequently, the mystery religions are still mysterious. Uh, and they, their vow, you have to remember this, their vow was an initiatory rite. It was a ceremony that got you inside these mystery religion groups. All right, so that's how the term starts. And then the Greek philosophers began to pick up the term mystery uh, it's, they, they're adopting this vocabulary of the mystery religions. For the philosophers, the mystic teaching of striving for truth was a pursuit of mystery. So there's various different things. They're trying to understand reality. They're trying to understand the way things are made. They're trying to understand the way, uh, what is real and what is not real, how we can know things. And there's these questions the philosophers have argued about for thousands of years. But 
these things, these hidden things are, are mysterious. They're hidden. So they began to use this, uh, this um, uh, term to describe those things that they were striving for. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, it's a very famous one, but there's Plato. Uh, is very famous for his cave illustration. And he talks about mankind, the way our life is now, we're, we're, like we're shackled in a cave. And there's a fire that is outside the cave, and its light is shining in the cave. And as things, as we experience things in this life, they walk past the mouth of the cave, and we see their shadows on the wall of the cave. So, he says, so what we see in this world, here's his analogy, what we see in this world is the shadows. So we see chairs, we see a pulpit, we see a stage, we see a building, but that's a shadow of an ultimate reality. And even people are shadows of an ultimate reality. And the real reality is out there in the mystery regions. All right, you see? And the, now that's Plato. There are different philosophers that have different ways of doing this. But basically, seeking after truth was trying to find the mystery. And so, of course, words aren't going to stay in any one camp. They aren't going to stay with just the philosophers. But it's going to come into common usage. So the term becomes more or less ordinary. So we'll talk about the mysteries of life. You know, pe Greek people would talk about that. And in fact, we'll talk about that. In our culture, there's, you know, there's things and there's certain things. You know, the more you study them, the more you learn. And we uncover mysteries. Okay? And it's not just mystery in the sense of a crime, but mystery in things that we don't know. And we uncover them and it's, you know, it's part of the pursuit of knowledge and so forth. So these terms uh, w became common and ordinary started with the mystery religions, got into philosophy, and then got into just basically ordinary usage. So that's the Greek background. All right. So now we want to talk about the New Testament usage of the word mystery. And I'm going to give you a few examples on the screen. We will get back to Colossians 1 in just a minute. The first one is in the Gospels. And here's Mark 4.11. And Jesus says, he's saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. And so we have a similar statement in Matthew 13, verse 11, and Luke verse, uh, chapter 8 and verse 10. So here the disciples are being differentiated from the outsiders. The message is that God gives a true appre appreciation for all the kingdom means to his disciples alone. So, the, um, now it's not something that, it's not because they are given a special, they have a special privilege. They went through some kind of rite, they learned the secret code, and now they're on the inside. It's not that at all. For the Lord, it's the person who's a believer really does understand the teachings of the scriptures in a way that people who aren't believers simply don't understand. All right? So I'm just giving a summary of this. This is a very big topic. So I'm just giving summary statements here. But that's something that uh, Jesus taught in the, uh, about the mystery of the kingdom, the, things, the teachings of the kingdom. Now, people who aren't believers can read the New Testament. They can understand the meaning of the words. But for them, the kingdom is just something that Jesus or the apostles imagined. It's not something that is real to them. But for a believer, he reads these things. He reads these promises. He knows these, this, these promises are part of his future. So that's what we mean to be in on the mystery. All right? So in Paul, there's a general usage of the term in various different ways. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 13.2 and 14.2, Paul talks about the things that are revealed by the gift of prophecy. These are mysteries. Things that were hidden, now they're being revealed by the gift of prophecy. And then the, uh, in Romans chapter 11, Paul will talk about the final destiny, destiny of Israel. This is a mystery that's been hidden. It's even hidden from the Jews. They don't understand it. They don't accept it. They don't know what's going to happen. They have, uh, by and large, the unbelieving Jews, have not accepted it. So the final destiny of Israel, Romans 11.25, is a mystery. He speaks in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, about the mystery of the rapture. The mystery of the rapture is a thing that's hidden, wasn't known before, it is now revealed. Uh, in 
Ephesians 5, 32, he talks about the mystery of Christ and his church being illustrated by marriage. So we have the coming together of a husband and a wife. He says, this is like Christ's love for the church. He says, this is a mystery. doesn't mean that marriage is mysterious, other than most of us don't understand it, but there is, <laughs> but there is uh, the, the picture of a marriage is depicts or illustrates for us something of the truth of that mysterious relationship between Christ and the church. Okay, the kind of intimacy, the kind of love are as that between Christ and the whole body of believers, not individual believers, but the whole body of believers, right? And then we see Paul talking about the mystery of last things, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3, and also uh, John picks it up in Revelation 17 where he talks about mystery Babylon. All right, so the mystery of Christ. Uh, let's see, do I want to get... All right, I'm going to show you the next verse. I'm working my way towards first, uh, second, uh, first. Let me try this again. First Corinthians chapter two, verses six through eight. So Paul is talking about the preaching of the mystery of Christ. He talks first about the apostolic. Uh, pr Paul preached the cross in chapter one. He talks about Paul preaching the cross. He says this is a stumbling block to the Jews. Okay, the resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection. Stumbling block to the Jews. The part they stumbled at was the cross. Like, how could the Messiah die? That's the thing that they stumble at. It's a mystery to them that the Messiah could die. And it's, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. The, Greeks, the, foolish, the part that the Greeks stumble at is the resurrection. If somebody's dead, they're dead. That's what the Greeks think. Okay? And so here they are, they're in unbelief, and so they do not apprehend or understand the preaching of the cross. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, he says, but we are offering the plain testimony of God, the plain preaching. This is the truth coming from God. And then a little bit further, he comes down to uh, verse 6 through 8, and he talks about God's wisdom in a mystery. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So it is that mystery that is found in Jesus Christ who is the Messiah, the divine uh, supernaturally born Son of God. He is both God and man in one person. He is the perfect sacrifice for sins. He is the one who becomes our substitute on the cross. He becomes our life as he rises from the grave. So that is the mystery. God's wisdom was hidden in the past. It is revealed in the present, but it remains hidden to unbelievers. They're stumbling over it. They're rejecting it. They don't want to receive it. But it is made known to believers, which comes uh, now to our text in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to who? To his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, here we go. We have this term that means secret things, hidden things. That's the Greek usage. It comes, becomes employed by the writers of the New Testament, by the Lord Jesus himself, when he talks about the things that are hidden, that lost people don't understand. All right? So that's an, the New Testament use is talking about those types of things. And it talks about what... The cross does for believers. It gives us eternal life. It changes us from darkness to light. It joins us with Christ. And Christ comes to dwell in us. That is the mystery. That's what's accomplished by the cross. An amazing thing. All right. So that's that part of it, the message. Now we come to the connection in the church of mystery 
and sacrament. And for this now, we're going to step beyond the t writing of the scriptures into the into church history. So the church began to use the term mystery to refer to baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now it doesn't, it's not used that way in the New Testament. I want to make that clear. The term mystery, the Greek word mystery, mysterion, is not used to refer to the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. It's to re it refers to Christ, to the indwelling Christ. It refers to the teaching that Jesus gave. That's what it refers to in the New Testament. But the church began to use it to refer to the, the Lord's table, the mystery, right? Or to baptism, the mystery, right? It's a mystery rite. Now, they, what they were doing is they were reviving the old Greek mystery religion idea in a specific way. Now, they weren't endorsing the, the mystery religions. But in the Greek mystery religions, their initiation rites gave participants a share in their gods. Okay, in the false gods. So in, the Christ, in Christianity, the Christian churches realized that in communion and in baptism, we are illustrating that we are sharing in Jesus Christ. We have a fellowship with Jesus Christ. So this is our mystery, you see? So that's how they make the parallel. They're not trying to make Christianity like the pagan religions. They're just using an idea that came out of those old practices. So in baptism and Lord's Supper, they recreate symbolically the acts of Christ to initiate Christianity, and they, uh, they then become the rites. Uh, are they, they, so then the term, as we are initiated in the church, okay, what do we do? Well, we'll get baptized. And we take the Lord's Supper, okay? And these are big deals we're coming into, we're joining into this body. So that was the connection. The word has a meaning, but then it has a developed meaning in the church that isn't actually related to the Bible. All right, so then, of course, now, the, now we have uh, the church becoming, in the West, more Latin. And so they start using the term sacrament for this term mystery, when they're talking about the Lord's Supper. Okay, because sacrament means mystery. Right? General meaning. However, now let's talk about the term sacrament. Okay, so I told you earlier that it has the roots. There's two Latin words. One is sacro, which means consecrate, dedicate, devote. And then sacer, or saker, I guess you'd say it. We get sacerdotalism. Okay, that's a big, long theological word. Anyway, but it has to do, sacer, or saker, probably pro pronounced properly, or probably sacer. Uh, there's no soft consonants in Latin, other than the S. Okay, sacer, sacred or holy, that's what that means. So sacro means consecrate, dedicate, devote. Sa saker means sacred or holy. So sacramentum, interesting, the original meaning of this word has nothing to do with religion. It has to, well, well, nothing directly to do with religion. It is sacred, but it is it, it's done this way. What is a sacramentum? Well, you have a dispute with somebody, and so uh, you, uh, I'm not sure why they would do this, but they had a, the idea was a sum of money would be pledged, all right? The one person is suing this other person. They both put up a sum of money. The winner gets his money back. The loser's money goes to the religious services of the winner's choice. All right? So it's given to the temple, right? Sort of like a modern bet for a charity of the winner's choice. Okay? I was shocked. What? That's exactly where the term comes from. Later on, it became a technical term for a soldier's oath of service. So when a soldier, because it has this connection with devotion, all right, when it's dealing with a lawsuit, you're devoting that money to the gods. Now, in a soldier who's coming into the army, what's he doing? He's devoting his life to who? The emperor, right? 
Okay, now I, I don't get to, you know, I get orders. I'm told, you be here at a certain time and you're there or you suffer discipline, all right? Okay, so, you, so the soldier, it's an, and in fact, the sacramentum for a soldier is his oath where he begins his service as a soldier. He becomes a soldier. So he has to offer a sacramentum in order to become a soldier in the Roman army. And he gives his life over to the service uh, for the emperor. And so the two terms are joined in church history in this way. The terms first become full equivalents only in Christian texts since the Romans conscripted sacramentum for military use. By this time, it's exclusively a military term. Tertullian and some later writers applied the military use to the Christian concept of the sacramentum. So what does this mean? In the church, the disciple takes an oath to follow Christ, to, vote, to devote himself completely to him. The oath is symbolized by both baptism, the initiation, and communion, the renewal. These rites in the church are now called mystery in Greek and sacramentum in Latin. And in essence, what this means is, Christ in you, the hope of glory, you are a soldier for Jesus Christ, entirely devoted to him. Entirely devoted to him. Now, all that is very interesting, but here's the application. So here we have the communion elements. And we, we believe in a believer's... We believe each believer is to examine himself. Now, it should be just a believer. It shouldn't be somebody who's not a believer. That's why generally you don't have the little children taking it. Unless they've really made a clear profession of faith and have been baptized. All right? But what it, the reason is that it symbolizes not just your union with Christ. It does symbolize that. But it symbolizes your entire conscious devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, when you participate in communion, is it merely just that ritual you do once a month at church? Or is it a renewal of your commitment to live entirely for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you belong to him? The sacramentum was the oath the warrior took to give his life to the emperor. Communion is the symbol that Christ gave his life for you and your life belongs to him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time today as we've considered this topic, it's a topic of interest to us because we think about these funny words. But Lord, it means more than just funny words. It means indeed the devotion of our lives, of our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we partake of communion in just a few moments, that you would stir us up to be devoted and faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.